Uh, welcome everybody to 2023. Um, I got to close out the year with the last webinar in December of 2022. I get to open up this year with you again. So I'm pretty happy about that. Uh, my name is Charlie Morton. I am a technical marketing engineer working with ICE. And we're going to go over some of the basic configurations for guest access today. Um, during today's webinar and demo, we're going to talk about WebAuth since that's how we actually log into the guest portals through ICE and what's the difference between local and central WebAuth. Then we're going to go through the different hotspots that ICE gives us so that you can see how not, not only how they're configured, but what they look like for a guest that is experiencing your guest portal. So let's just jump right in and talk about what is guest access. In the most basic form, guest access is just you allowing access to the network for people outside of your organization. The scary part of it is that you're using your network devices to provide this access. So that's why we want to try to secure it a bit so that they don't have access to resources that you don't want them to. Now, within ICE, we do support up to a million guest accounts and the credentials can be emailed, printed, or sent via text to the guest user once they register. Uh, we can also customize the portal language and support multilingual environments, and we can use social media login. Uh, in our case, it's just Facebook at this point to provide a quick uh, login for, for end users that are registering through our guest portals. You can also manage the guest accounts through REST APIs. Now, with ICE, there are three different types of guest accounts. The most basic, of course, being the hotspot guest portal. Uh, this gives you immediate, uncredentialed internet access. It's the fastest way to get your guests onto the internet. And then from there, we have a self-registered guest account. And what that does is you go to the SSID and it asks you some information and it creates an account for you. And then we have a sponsored account. What this is, is you have specific people inside your organization who create accounts and hand out the different accounts to the guest users. Or if a guest user registers themselves through an SSID that requires a sponsor approval, then your sponsors will be able to approve that. And we'll show you all of these flows in our demos coming up. But one thing I want to bring up, though, is these two guest access are credentialed portals. So you have to use a username and a password, whereas the hotspot portal is not. However, you can set up an access code for the hotspot portal. So it's just not, you know, free access for anybody sitting in a parking lot trying to get onto the network. This way, they actually have to have something that they know that you provide to log into your guest portal. So having said all of that and going through the basics of the guest portals, what guest portals do you currently use or are you planning on using? If you could just type that into the Slido window here, then that will help us to help tailor not only this uh, webinar and presentation, but the one in February as well. And I see a lot of people are using, wow, Hotspot and self register just keep trading back and forth between the two. So, but sponsored guests has many different ways of people were using it. So it looks like they might actually have more sponsored guests than anything. So that's pretty cool. All right, so moving on, we're gonna talk about local web auth versus central web auth. For local web auth, you have a guest user that comes in and it joins the SSID and then they're presented with a guest portal. Now, if this portal is hosted on your network device, like uh, our WLCs are able to do, then that's going to be a local web auth. It's locally hosted on that local network device that you're logging into. That is exactly what local web auth is. However, if you are going to send all that traffic and redirect it to a centralized server that will host these portals, in this case, we're going to use ICE for that, that's central web auth. So 
that right there, that's the difference between the two. Uh, with the central web auth and ICE being a radius server that does so much more with it, you can actually secure it a bit more and have more control over your guest accounts. So the way that the guest access works is your guest endpoint is going to talk to your network device. That network device is going to send your MAB request to ICE. And the information it sends to ICE is going to be, you know, the MAC address, identity, session ID, and the NAS IP address, whatever network device that the request is coming from. So ICE is going to take a look at that and send back to the network device the ACL and the URL redirect to send to the guest endpoint so that when they do access the web, whether it's through the uh, captive network browser or through their regular web browser, it's going to redirect that traffic to the ICE login page, whereas they can either register for access or if they have a, an account already, they can log in to that guest portal. Then once they do that, the username and password is sent to ICE for the authentication. Once that authentication succeeds, the MAC address, the identity, session ID, and NAS IP address, if you see the difference between the username and password, what it sends back after you log in from the initial request, the only thing that has changed is the identity. And the identity is that portal user ID that was used for logging into that guest portal. Now, for a hotspot portal, since there is no username and password, that identity is going to remain the MAC address. Then once ICE gets that information, it sends back the guest access ACL to the network device, allowing that endpoint to access the guest network. Now, one thing about that identity being the username here is that we can actually use that as an attribute in our conditions on which we can build policies in our authorization pro, uh, policies as well. And one question that we get a lot of times is, all right, well, how do I secure my network so that my guest network is totally secure from my internal network? Well, there are three basic ways of deploying your PSNs all from the same ICE deployment to be able to host your guest network. One is the one big happy network. Everything is all on the same network and talking, and you're using ACLs, maybe SGTs to segment everything. So you have your web authentication going to your ICE PSN, and that comes back, you get your ACL, then you're allowed to go through to the internet. The other way to do it is if you place your PSN in the DMZ so that your guest network talks to your access point and the WLC says, well, that SSID only talks to this PSN that's in the DMZ. Then once you get that, you can talk to the internet. The caveat here that you need to know about is if you do it this way, at some point you're going to have to create holes in the firewall so that your PSN can talk to your admin node. So that's one thing for your network administrators to take a look at and see if they want to put those holes in there. The other way to do it is to kind of straddle the DMZ and the internal network with your PSN. You have one interface in the DMZ and one interface on your internal network. That way you can talk to the PAN and you still have your separation of services in your DMZ from your internal network. Of course, the other way of doing it that is not part of the same deployment is to have a separate ICE deployment just for your guest sitting in your DMZ. So when I go and show you the demos that I have set up for today, I'm going to use three different uh, SSIDs. I've got the demo guest as myself registered. That's actually going to be the one that I have where my PSN is in the DMZ. And you'll see some of the fun stuff that happens with, with that as well. Um, and then I have my demo hotspot and my demo sponsor that's part of my one big happy network. So that's all relatively easy to, to set up and to use here. Um, before I get into the demos though, I do wanna know what guest access options or settings would you like to see as a demo? And if, if it's something that we're gonna get to today, awesome, great. If it's not, then it's something that I can actually put into what we're doing for next month in our advanced series.
Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and move on to our demos. And what we're gonna talk about here is the hotspot demo. This is our quick win, our easy to use hotspot demo. So basically what you're gonna do with this is get your guests to the internet as quickly as possible. So having said that, what I'm using is the work center. And if you go into your work center and guest access, you're gonna get this great overview page that really tells you what steps you need to go ahead and build out guest access, no matter which type of portal you're looking to use. And then if you look up top, you have this whole menu system that is only menu items that directly correlate with the guest access. So if we go into portals and components, you see we have three different portals here. Best practice is not to use the defaults, but to duplicate the defaults. Duplicate whichever one you want and then create it from there. That way you always have your default portals and you know what the default settings are. And if you do happen to mess up a portal for any reason, you just delete it and start over. So I'm gonna go and look at the portal settings first. I clicked on the wrong button there. As you can see, we're using Gigabit Ethernet Zero. We're using our guest endpoints identity group. That's where all of our MAC addresses are gonna go. We'll take a look at the endpoint identity groups later. Then in our acceptable use policy page, this is where we can put the access code if we wanna use an access code for our hotspot portal. And of course I do. A post access banner page, that's good for GDPR, but other than that, it's just an extra click, an extra page. So I typically don't turn that on. For the authentication success settings page, I'm just gonna send it to my website just because it gives them a visual indication that, hey, you now have access to the internet. It, it's quick and easy. You can put whatever you want to in there. Originating URL requires specific um, hardware and codes to use that. And for every portal that I create, I always include a support information page. It's a great way to help in troubleshooting if some issues do arise. So once we save that, we're gonna go ahead over, you can see the server response is saved successfully. We're gonna click on the portal test URL. And as you can see, it automatically opens up to an IP address. And this IP address is actually my Azure uh, instance device. So I'm just gonna stop that real quick. Sorry about that. I wanted to show you that this is what your portal is going to look like. We're not gonna follow this flow all the way through because I'm gonna show you that live on an endpoint device, but this is your basic default view for the hotspot portal with an access code. So from there, we're gonna go in and build out the policy elements that we need to create a policy. And for that, we need to go into our policy elements and results and create authorization profiles. Now, as you can see, I have hotspot redirect and guest access. For my hotspot redirect, I'm actually using a, a Meraki access point for this. So go down to web redirection in the common task. And if, as you can see, if you click on that drop down, you have specific number of items that you can choose. My ACL is not, I'm not using ACL here. And then I can choose my hotspot guest webinar portal that you saw me create. And then if you go into guest access, this authorization profile is going to use the airspace ACL. And that is named guest access. And I'll show you over here in my Meraki what that means and why I'm not using a redirect ACL or yeah. So if I go into my demo hotspot, I'm using Mac based access control and I am using the splash page for Cisco Identity Services. Now, if we go into the advanced splash settings, you can see I'm using my walled garden. Now, inside the walled garden, I'm putting in the IP address of my PSN. This is why I don't need to use an ACL here because I only have access to that. 
So then my radius servers, of course, this is the same PSN. And then the radius attribute for specifying group policy is the airspace ACL name. That's why I use that attribute in the authorization profile. So the group policy in Meraki, that's what we use as the ACL. If we go to network wide and then group policies in our Meraki dashboard, we can see that we have the guest access group policy here. And I'm denying all my internal for my corporate network, my branch network. So the only thing my guests have access to is the internet and that's it. I'm using the same authorization profile for all my guest access. The only thing that will change is going to be The only thing that will change is going to be the redirect profile. So, all right, sorry about letting that video get a little bit ahead of me. I was a little bit more verbose than I thought I was going to be. All right, so the other thing that we need to do is to create an allowed protocols for MAB only. So I'm a big proponent of you create a different allowed protocols for each way you access the network. And for MAV, for guests, all you need is process host lookup. As you can see, nothing else is turned on. So all we're using is process host lookup, which essentially enables MAV. So now if we go to the policy sets, you can see I have a policy set here for a hotspot guest. If you, the request comes in using the Meraki device type, with an SSID and a hotspot, we use MAB only for our allowed protocols. And our authentication policy, I'm not using the default policy. I created a new policy that says if it's a wireless MAB request and authentication fails, continue. If user is not found, continue. Because if the user is not failed, if the user is not found, the authentication will fail. So we need to continue on to auth authorization so we can get that redirect. Now you see we have the hotspot access is above the hotspot redirect and the reason we do that is if you're a part of that guest endpoint if you already registered your device as part of guest endpoint you don't want to go through that redirect again i just will automatically be able to find your mac address inside guest endpoints and just allow you onto the network whereas have you not already registered then you're going to hit that second rule and that's when you're going to get the redirect. And that's why the specific order here really does matter. All right. So now we're going to get out of here. No, I don't want to go there. I want to go up and go to the live logs. So let's go to operations, live logs. And what I'm going to do here is this is my phone over here. Um, I've blurred out some SSIDs to secure my neighbors and i'm accessing the demo hotspot as you can see captive browser automatically comes up i put in my passcode um once i access the ssid you saw my entries here in the live log and then once i click the accept button i got my change of authorization and i got into the the network um, you saw it redirected me to the website i'm going back out to the full browser i'm able to browse the web and from there you can see that the authentication policy the authorization policy and the authorization profiles that have been hit are the exact ones that i wanted them to hit in the exact order they were supposed to so That was an abrupt end to my video. I'm sorry about that, but that is the flow for the hotspot portal. Um, I don't think that was the end though, was it? It was not, see? I knew there was more to it. All right, so what we're going to do now is we want to talk about the self-registered guest portal. And before we create a self-registered guest portal, we need to talk about guest types. You see, there are four different guest types that are included as default with ICE. And these different guest types do and mean different things. Now, a lot of times people just refer to guest types as a length of time. As you can see, we have the daily and the weekly. 
but we also have contractor and social login. So you don't have to just think of guest types as the length of time. Consider them a specific role to which you want to assign guests. So for a contractor, you can have an account duration of a year, but the default account duration is 90 days. And of course, all of this is highly configurable and you can set it to any day that you want. Um, contractor daily and weekly, the timer starts from the sponsor specified date, or if it's a self-registered, it's date of self-registration. So keep that in mind. You can also change that to from first login. So if you, if you create the account for them as a sponsor and they don't log in for a week, then from first login, we'll still give them the 90 days from when they first logged in. The maximum simultaneous logins is three for everyone except daily, um, which makes sense because if you're using like a hotspot portal, then you only want them to be able to log in one time because the hotspot portal just uses the MAC address. So it doesn't make any sense to allow for more than that. Maximum devices guests can register. Same thing with that. The daily only makes sense to have only one. You can configure these from anywhere from one to uh, I think it's 99, but we'll we'll see when we go through the guest types in the demo. The reason I put the guest endpoints as the endpoint identity group is not only is that the default for every single guest type, but that doesn't mean it has to be guest endpoints. You can change that to be any endpoint identity group that you want. You can create new endpoint identity groups based upon the guest flow through which you're putting your users. So don't feel like you're locked into just using guest endpoints on that one. Now the sponsor groups, we'll dive into those deeper when we start talking about the sponsored portal, but this does actually come into account a little bit when we're talking about self-registered as well. So the sponsor groups, by default for all of your guest types, except for social login, are shown here. And it's the all accounts, group accounts, and own accounts. Those are all three of the sponsor groups that currently exist as a default through ICE. Okay, so now we're gonna go ahead and get through our self-registered guest demo. And again, we're going to start with the guest types and we're gonna look at the weekly guest type for a self-registered guest. All right, so from first login, like I said, is always a good way to start. But you know what, before I do this, I already broke a rule. So let's go ahead and change that back, go back to guest types, and we're going to, oh, you have to click on the bottom right corner of these things to select them. So select that, and then we're gonna duplicate the weekly. That way we keep our default weekly in there. So let's go ahead and we're gonna change this to self-registered. Since this is gonna be for our self-registered guest type, we're just gonna name it that. And now we're going to, of course, descriptions always matter. Why did I create this? Well, I forget, it was two years ago. If you put a description in here, then you know why you created it. Even a super basic description can be helpful, especially if someone's coming in uh, to work with you on something. So from first login, we're gonna do it for seven days. Uh, maximum simultaneous logins, three, we can keep it at that. Maximum devices, oh, it's 999, not 99. So we're gonna keep it at guest endpoints. Now we can send account expiration notifications but we're not going to. Uh, this is self-registered for only a week. So halfway through, we don't want to send them an email or a text telling them, hey, you're going to expire. If it was for like a 90-day account, then sure, we'd do that. But not in this case. So let's go ahead and we'll save that. And then we're going to go back to the guest portals. And we're going to duplicate our self-registered guest portal. And let's go in here. We're going to rename this, just put webinar at the end so we, we know that we're using this for today. And then we're going to go down to our portal settings here. And what we're going to do here is we're going to look at our
authentication method is we're going to be using a guest portal sequence. This is a, an identity source sequence. And we're going to talk about those later, but we're going to change our default guest type to self-registered. As you can see, the drop-down box doesn't like to follow the dark mode, so we have to hover over everything to see what's in there. Um, we're going to include the acceptable use policy as a link. Instead of having the text take up the whole page, we're just going to do it as a link. You can require them to accept the AUP as well if you would like them to do that. This is also where you would allow social login through Facebook, and we'll show that next month. We're going to go through that whole flow. But then we want to go through the registration form settings and, oh, wait a second. So we're going to also make sure that we assign this to guest type self-registered. As you see, the account valid line changed so that it's in line with the self-registered guest type. We're not going to have them put in their username. We're just going to assign that to them ourselves. We're going to require our first and last name here. We're not going to require the email address there, but with our selections down below, you'll see that it's going to automatically require them. And those selections are for the SMS provider. We're going to turn off the global default and just turn on the big three here for the U.S. is T-Mobile, AT&T, and Verizon. And you can edit or do anything you want to for the SMS gateway providers at that link, and we'll go through some of that in a little bit as well. So down here, we're going to disallow specific email addresses because, you know, if we have a domain that we see a lot of junk coming from, we don't want anything from there. I'm just putting AOL.com in there not to say there's anything bad about it, so don't get upset at me. And then we're going to send a credential notifications automatically using email and SMS, and that's going to require email and phone number for that. Self-registration success page is going to show them everything that they've put in, including their username and password. The print command will show the username and password on their screen, and they can use that to print to any networked printer that they have. We're not going to do an AUP page since that's on the sign-in page as a link. For the demo, we're not going to require a password change, though you definitely could. And of course, it's going to show you that it's less secure to not require that password change, which is totally true and fine. Um, we're going to automatically register. We're not doing BYOD, so we want to make sure that those settings are turned off. And by default, they are. You can also do device compliance or device posture through the guest flow which though is not a very good user experience is still an option. We're not doing a post login banner. Again, that's just an, another click. So we do want to include the support information page. As you can see, we're using an authentication success page instead of a website here. And I'll show you why once we get to that point. So we're going ahead and we're gonna save that. You know what, let's go ahead and do a quick customization here as well. Typically what I do in all of my portals, I didn't do it on the hotspot portal because I was showing you the quickest, easiest way to get to the internet. Put five spaces in the contact line here. That leaves that blank. You have to have something in there, but I don't want any text in there. So if I come down here to optional content too, I will toggle the HTML button, which is right there. Click on that, then you paste in the HTML here. And I'm, I'll give you the code for that little bit. And then you toggle the HTML off again, and you can see that it creates that button there. And that's what the button is going to look like. So we're going to save that. And now we're going to go and take a look at what that looks like in our test URL. As you can see, we have the button at the bottom now. We're going to click to register an account. Hey, look, it's me. I'm sorry that the text size on this is so small. I didn't realize that until after I had already compiled everything that when you create a new window, 
from ice, it just reverts back to the, the small text size. So yeah, I'm not giving you my phone number, so I'm sorry about that. But if I <laughs> click register here, this will actually send me a text and an email. So this is the account success page. Now from here, you can ask for your credentials again. If you check, oh, I got the email. And this is what the email looks like for the credentials. Let's, let's make it a little bit bigger so you can actually see what it says. All right. So that's what we have for our self-registered portal. If we go into our access control for our Meraki dashboard for that hotspot, not hotspot, but self-registered SSID, we can see that it's set up the same exact way as the hotspot is. It's the portal on ice that makes it different. So we have this the walled garden here with the PSN. This is the one that's hosted in AWS. And then that same PSN is in our radius servers and radius accounting servers, of course. And then our group policy, airspace, ACL name. So everything's the same except for the PSN that we're choosing to use. So if we go into our policy elements and look at our authorization profiles, we're going to create a new profile. And for this authorization profile, we're just going to make it super simple, self-reg redirect. And we're going to scroll down in the common tasks to the web redirection. And this time, see, we can't choose self-register, but we're, we are using centralized web auth. So that's what we're going to use here. Everything for guest access, we use centralized web auth except hotspot. Again, ACL is null and we're choosing the portal that we had just created. I don't have a local DNS server at my house, so I'm just going to use the IP address for my AWS node. And we're gonna scroll all the way down and save this. All right, now that we have that saved, we have to create a policy set. Now, you didn't get to see me create that for a hotspot guest, but I'm gonna go ahead and build this out real time for you so that you can see how actually quick and easy this really is. So self-registered guest, the fastest, no, the longest time it takes is for me to type. So <laughs> sorry about that. So here we're gonna choose the attribute and we're gonna change the dictionary to device. And the device type is going to be Meraki. These are network devices I have already set up in ICE. That's how we're accessing the network. Then our attribute is we're going to radius. Now called station ID is the name of the access point or MAC address of the access point. And it ends with a SSID. Now the last word in our SSID is ICE demo guest. So last word is guest. So anything that ends with guest will go there. And we're using our map only allowed protocols again. So once we go in here, Again, we don't use the default authentication policy. We create a new policy, and this is going to be our self-reg MAB. And then our conditions is actually pretty quick and easy. This is a pre-built condition. If we scroll down on the left side, we'll see wireless MAB. We'll drag that to our editor and click use. You can see that it's right there. We change to internal endpoints. And we select the options for authentication fail, continue, user not found, continue. Our authentication policy is complete. Let's move to our authorization policy. So remember what I said, we want the redirect to be on bottom. So we're gonna create our redirect first. And again, the conditions here, though it's still wireless map as we scroll down and see it the wireless map authorization condition is actually different than the wireless map authentication condition and then for our profile we're going to scroll down to self-reg redirect and now we can create our 
self-registered guest access. And this one is actually pretty simple as well. So in our conditions, we are going to use identity group as our attribute. So click on our dictionary, scroll down to identity group, name. And then once that equals guest endpoints, don't click save, scroll down and click use. That puts it in your authorization rule and then guest access. Now we can save that. And from here, we can go to our live log again. All right, now bring up the phone. There we go, I had to get it connected. Now it's connecting. Oh, you can see that it's made the connection because our live log has shown some data. Our mini browser popped up and let's register a new account. All right, so this is Penelope People Pleaser, because why not go with alliteration whenever you can? I'm going to use the same email address. I'm going to get a different um, email notification, of course, and I'll show you that. But I'm also going to put in the mobile number. Oh, wait, I got a errant space here. Let's get rid of that. Okay. Go ahead and put in my mobile number here. United States is all the way at the bottom. So scroll down, put that in, put in the SMS provider and register. Oh, an attempt to text your account information to you has failed. Attempt to email account information has failed. Well, remember what I said, this is my PSN that's in the DMZ. And because it's in the DMZ, this PSN does not have access to the text or email servers. But I do have access onto the network, as you can see here. I just didn't get the credentials. So that's the other reason you want to use that um, authorization success page at that moment is because if you're using that PSN and the DMZ, they can log on to the network from that page using that sign on button. Let's go back to that real quick so you can see that. You see that bottom button there, sign on? That will just use their credentials to get them onto the network from that page. Now, once you do that, we can go ahead and get out of the mini browser. Let's make sure we're signed on. Boom, we're signed on. So let's go ahead and click the done. We're gonna get out of settings and go ahead and look at our Chrome browser. All right, so now we're in Chrome. Let's open it up. All right, we're gonna go to NFL.com. What's going on there? Hey, look at that, wild cards coming up. Yay. All right, <laughs> so now that we've got that and we're on the internet, let's take a look at the way that we can manage these accounts. Now, as you've noticed, and if you've played around with ICE Guest at all, you'll see that there is nowhere inside of the ICE GUI itself that you can see the guest accounts, let alone manage or do anything with them. The only way to manage guest accounts is through the sponsor portal. We're going to talk in depth about the sponsor portal once we move to the sponsored guest demo, but this is to show you that any guest, whether it's a self-registered guest or a sponsored guest, is managed through this same portal. Now, we're going to go ahead and log in here, but you know what? I'm going to log in as the admin, and I want to show you something. Using the sponsor portal, you cannot log in as the default super admin in ICE. You have to use a network access user that is assigned to one of the sponsor types or sponsor groups. So that's an important distinction here as well. So let's go ahead and log in as the network access user that I showed you a while ago. Oh, wait, that's me. 
All right, so once you get in, you'll see that you have four buttons at the top. One is manage accounts. So we're gonna go into manage accounts, find Penelope, Penelope People Pleaser, and we're gonna resend credentials. So let's click to resend and let's resend through text. Oh, I can't. Okay, well then let's resend through email. Oh, I can't do that either? All right, so let's go back over to ICE and see why I can't do these. So if we go back to our Work Center's guest access and settings, you'll see that we have guest email settings on the left. And send notification sponsored email address is the default. I want to always send from the default address. So if I do that, Look, I didn't even have to log out and log back in or anything. I could just do it right away. So refresh and look at that. I've got my new account credentials for Penelope People Pleaser. So, all right, cool. Now let's go to our portals and components and our sponsor groups. Remember the C. Morton account was part of the all accounts group. If you scroll all the way down, uh, Let's, let's show you that it's part of the All Accounts group. There you go. That way we've verified which group it's a part of. Now we're gonna scroll all the way down to the bottom of this page. And you can see that almost everything is selected except for send SMS notifications with, with guest credentials. So once we save that and we click resend, we can Go ahead and send that SMS message and boom, as you can see, we just got the text on our phone. The notification doesn't show up during the screen recording on the phone, but you can see that I've just got that notification. Okay, so now we're going to move on to our sponsored guest demo. Now, like I said, there are two different types of sponsored guests that we're going to go through. The first one is to have a sponsor create all the accounts to hand out to the guests. As you can see, I've created more network access users and I've used different identity groups for them. I'm using the all accounts, the group accounts, and the own accounts identity groups for these. Now, if you click on one of your users or even when you're creating your user, you have the spot down below under user groups, and that's where you assign these accounts to your user. It doesn't have to just be sponsor groups. It can be any type of identity groups that you create for your user. All right, so let's go back to our sponsor groups, and we'll take a look at our all accounts sponsor group. As you can see, the members of the All Accounts Sponsor Group is anyone in All Accounts. You can actually add um, Active Directory groups here or a, a lot of other external identity sources. We're going to add our second location here in Raleigh to be managed by this sponsor group as well. I like to auto, always automatically email guests on account creation just because it's convenient, not for only for us, but for the guests as well. And for a sponsor group for all accounts, I'm gonna give it a prefix for all of our created accounts that the sponsor will create. Of course, um, this sponsor can manage all guest accounts. That's why the name of the group is all accounts. It, we already turned on the SMS notifications, but also if you want this sponsor to be able to use guest REST API to manage guest accounts, you have to turn on that last checkbox as well. We're not doing that in this webinar, but I want you to be aware of that. So now we're gonna look at group accounts. Same thing, group accounts, anyone is a member of group accounts is a member of this group. Let's add Raleigh back into this one as well automatically email guests because ease. And we're gonna use a username prefix for this one as well. This is group, of course, because 
I am so imaginative and creative, right? So this one, the sponsor can manage only those accounts created by members of this sponsor group, all right? Not just this one sponsor, but anyone that is a part of this sponsor group. And of course, turn on the SMS notifications for this one as well. So we'll save that and we'll go back to our sponsor groups. And this is the own accounts. So you can only see and do anything for the accounts that you yourself create. Anybody that's part of the own accounts cannot see anybody else's accounts or guests or anything like that. You can only manage the accounts that you have created yourself. I'm also not going to allow SMS notification and I'm only allowing approval for accounts that this sponsor has created. All right, now we're going to save that. And we're going to create a sponsored guest portal. As you can see, it's already been created, but we're going to go through the settings and show you what those are. So for the portal settings, all of our default ports are 8443. We're using the same guest portal sequence and we're going to use the contractor guest type for our sponsor portal. We're going to include the AUP as a link. We're not going to allow guests to create their own accounts. We want to create the accounts to give to the guests. So everything else is going to be turned off like it was before except for the support information page. We, of course, want to make sure that that is enabled. And here we go. Now, I want to show you real quick. If you click the change password, you can change your password. But if you click on your support information, this is the information that you get. And as you can see, it says contact the help desk at X, 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 X. Well, let's go ahead and fix that real quick. Let's update that. And we do that through the portal page customization. If we scroll down, you can see on the left side where we have support information. That's what we want to update. And then we go scroll down to where we see the phone number placeholder. Let's go ahead and put in the phone number. We're going to scroll up and save that. Again, you can use this mini browser that it shows in the interface here to preview what you're going to see and this shows it on a mobile phone you can change it to desktop but as we use our preview link and click the contact support you can see that it updates rather quickly and you can change any of this information to show what you want it to show now you can then go into your sponsor portal and Instead of creating a new sponsor portal, we're only going to add an FQDN for the sponsor portal and make sure that that is also in your DNS server. And then scroll all the way down and we're gonna make sure that our support page is also enabled because it's not just you know, IT that's logging into sponsor portals, it can be anybody from any department. So if they're having issues logging into your sponsor portal, then you want to have a support page for that as well. But that's how we got the sponsor.securitydemo.net to log in to this, and it automatically redirects to the sponsor portal. Now we're going to use the help desk, which is part of the all accounts group. And as you can see, if you click on manage accounts, it shows all of the accounts that I created under my username. So it shows all the accounts. And you can use a random uh, generator to create random guest accounts. If you, you, know, you have a conference or a, a team or a game coming up. If we change the guest type to contractor, you can see that all of the information for the length of time that the account can be active changes in retrospect to whatever the contractor is. So before I create these accounts, I want to sign out. I, I'm just going to show you that if I log in using my sponsor account here, which is a part of the group accounts, 
then I cannot see any of the accounts that are already created. So if you go to the manage accounts, it's empty. There's nothing there. So this is a way to keep security on who gets to see what is part of the sponsor accounts. All right. So I'm going to go over here to the guest access settings. I'm going to take a look at the username policy. And as you can see in the username policy, we're using upper and lowercase alphabet and all numeric, but we're not using any special characters. Here we are using alphanumeric and uppercase and lowercase. But what I'm showing here on my phone is that, let me go back here real quick. All right, so there we go. So if you click on the number button, oh, I don't like this interface sometimes. See? Where am I? I am so sorry. There we go. All right. If you click on the numbers button, you'll get this here for special characters. So if you have to click on that special characters button on your phone, that's going to make it so that it's a bad user experience for any of your guests. So typically, any characters that I have in these two rows, I will remove from the special characters so that they don't have to click the two buttons just to put in a special character to get onto a network that they're only going to be on for a week or two, right? So I just take those out so that when I generate random accounts, the passwords aren't generated with those special characters, making it hard for people to log on to the network. So now I'm going to sign out of here. I'm going to log back in as help desk. And one thing that you'll notice when I log in here is that I don't get an AUP this time. So I have these accounts set up that I only get the AUP on the first login. All right, so now I'm going to click on random. I want to create 50 accounts. And they're all contractor accounts. Let's go ahead and get those created. All right, so now we have 50 accounts created and we can give these out to whomever. We could also go in here and if we click on manage accounts, we can choose any one of these accounts and we can assign a first name, last name and email address to any one of these accounts. But honestly, that's way too much work. If you're going to go through all of that, you might as well let your visitors self-register and have a sponsor approval. Or you can import accounts as well. And you just do a CSV file, you import it here. There's always a template that you can download so you know exactly what information is needed. All right, so again, your sponsor, your group accounts cannot see your all accounts, but your all accounts can see your group accounts. Now, I understand that we are coming up on time, so I'm going to get through this as much as possible. Uh, I'm going to create a new web portal. And this is going to be a self-registered guest with sponsor approval. So... One thing that you probably notice is that our self-registered portal, all the settings and everything are the same as the settings for our sponsored portal. And, you know, it's, it's meant to be that way. 
because we can do both with each one of these portals. So we're going to create this this portal real quick and we're going to go to our login page settings and we are going to allow guests to create their own accounts and in the registration form settings i'm again no username so we'll turn off the username we will require first and last name and yeah let's turn off company as well all right, and let's use Raleigh for our time zone and do our top three for SMS. We do want to keep person being visited and reason for visit. And let's see, I want guests to be approved. I don't want to allow automatic uh, login after approval or great access i just want them to be approved first so i put in the sponsored email address here which thankfully is black text in a black text box so let me highlight that for you so you can see what i'm putting so yeah and the different choices you have here is either the person being visited can approve them or the sponsor email address below, which can also be a, a mail list or a mailer. And then we have the approve and deny links. We just want to do a, a single click link to approve. The links are valid for three hours. Nice white text on a white text box. So that's helpful. And self-registration success page. So that's the same thing. Um, that will allow them to see the status of the approval coming in. We want to send the credentials through email and SMS. And we want to, of course, make sure that in our self-registration success settings, there is no option for a username or a password or to send yourself the credentials because you've not been approved yet. So we can't give you that information to get onto the network until you've been approved. So that's why those are grayed out and not able to be checked. So make sure our support information page is there. We're going to save this. All right, we're saved. Um, our portal page customization, let's go ahead and change our banner real quick. Save it again. All right, now we're going to check out our portal test URL. And here we go. We're going to register for guest access here. And we're going to go through the process of registering our new account. All right. First name, last name, email address. Get to typing, buddy. There we go. Sometimes it takes me a minute to wake up. More coffee, right? Of course, I'm going to use my same email address here so that I can just show you quickly the email notification I get for my credentials and whether I am allowed onto the network. I'm also going to put in my phone number to get a text, change my SMS pro provider to Verizon. I'm visiting Mark at Mark E. All right. So the approval email has been sent. I'm going to log in as sponsor. Oh, look, I got an approval request. I've got a link to approve or to deny for Rip Van Winkle. I'm going to approve, log into the sponsor real quick, sponsor portal real quick. All right, and submit that. All right, Rip Van Winkle has been approved. Go back over here. Oh, by the time I can get back over, I've already been uh, allowed internet through this network. So that is self-registration. <laughs> 
with sponsor approval. That was pretty quick, but I know we're running a little bit late today. And if we take a look at our live logs, we're gonna see, even though we did that through our uh, portal test URL, it still shows in our live log. Okay, so. I have the link here for the guest access per script deployment guide. That is where all of this information that I've gone through today is pretty much in that guide. The one thing that is not is that contact support button. And this is the code that I put into that contact support button. But I'm going to have a lot more code and a lot more information uh, next month when I do the advanced guest. And from that, I'm going to have a, a new GitHub repository I'm going to create. And this code will also be in that github repository and for any more ice resources we definitely have all of these links as well thank you for staying a few minutes past time with me today i know we had a lot to cover 